last few weeks, um, we've, been, we've been going through this book and, and we've been asking the question, does grace really win? This thing which makes Christians who we are, the, the gospel. Just so you know, uh, Christianity is defined by a certain set of beliefs about the God-man Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul said this in Corinthians. I delivered to you, Corinthians, that which is of first importance. Namely, that Christ died and was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He's like, just to remind you what it's all about. It's all about the gospel, the story of God who is more holy and amazing than we could ever imagine. Looking upon humankind that's more broken than we would ever like to admit with compassion. And sending his son Jesus to live a life we couldn't live, to die a vicarious substitutionary death in our place for our sins, and then to rise, overcoming death and everything that separates us from God in our place. And that by faith in him, by looking to him, by trusting in him, we are made right with God. We're made righteous. We are justified. Which is exactly where we're going today. See, the battle of the book of Galatians was that, okay, was it really going to be grace? Was it really going to be the free, unmerited gift of God which brings us into relationship with him? Or is it grace and, grace plus, grace-ish? And this week, we find ourselves squarely in the heart of the battle. Now, normally when I preach, I like to give you like a, a, a nice little phrase or something to be like the bag in which you put everything in that I'm about to say. But this week, this text kind of evades that. We're talking about the doctrine of justification. And now every preaching and church growth book that I've ever read says that I should never say two words in front of a church that I'd like to get bigger, namely the word doctrine and another word justification. Really anything with more than like five syllables or a whole lot of books written by dead guys, I should just avoid. What I should be doing up here is just telling you about the good things about Christianity, how it can improve your life. If you just live biblically, then things will go better for you. Jesus is going to be like kind of your life improvement tool, and that's what I'm supposed to do for you. The only problem with that is the Bible. Um, the, <laughs> the scriptures say that my job, that me and Pastor Donnie's job, that the elders of this church, that our job is to declare to you the gospel. And in so doing, equip you saints for works of ministry. Not do all of it, but get you so in love with Jesus, so radically transformed by grace, that you go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations which is what Jesus told us all to do. So that's what I'm going to do here for you today. And before I do, I need to pray. Will you pray with me? God, I love you. Um, I just confess that I need you this morning. I need you, God. Open my mouth and open my friend's ears to hear the good news of the gospel, that we are justified, justified, justified by grace through faith this morning. Make that new and fresh to us today. In the name of Jesus, amen. We will be in, amen. Uh, we will be in Galatians, um, <clears throat> Galatians 3, uh, 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified by God, or ju justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith justification, justification, rightness, righteousness, doing the right thing. There are a couple of problems when a guy like me stands up before people like you to talk about a topic like this, namely, and I can hear the question almost without you asking it, why do we care about this? Kind of looking like, why are we, why are we talking about this? Isn't this just some Christian doctrine that's buried, you know, under pages and pages of stuff that only geeks like me, you know, really get excited about, but it has nothing to do with you. Why are we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about what Jesus has to say about politics or, you know, these protests going on or money or something more apparent, and I'll tell you why. There are two things, actually, that I would say about them. The first is because it matters. Some things matter, whether you're aware of them or not. They just do. For instance, 
It doesn't matter to you, maybe, that you're driving 79 miles an hour until you're pulled over. It mattered, whether you knew it or not. Are you feeling me? Some of you can relate to that far too well. Um, But it it matters. And the second thing that I would say about this idea of justice and justification and being right is that I actually think it already matters to you quite a bit. We all speak in moral categories. We're moral creatures. We say, this is good, that's not good. Someone ought to do this, someone ought not do this. It doesn't matter if we're Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, straight-up communist. It doesn't matter. Mac, PC, it doesn't matter. We, um, we have opinions about what is right and what is wrong. And the whole idea is to not do the wrong and to be in the right. To be in the right. And so the idea, the theme, the, the kind of the sun at the solar system of this sermon today is this idea of justification, righteousness. They're all interplayed in the same word because they all come from the same root word, dikaios, in the Greek New Testament. And it literally means to be made right, to be righteous. What does it mean? What does it mean to be right before God? Now, this is a curious thing. We all speak in moral categories. We we all already do this. And I think it betrays the fact that we all already care. If we all already care about what it means to be right on a political issue, right on a financial issue, which there are lots of opinions about those these days, lots of parties going on, tea parties, anti-capitalism parties, Occupy parties. I got invited to none of these parties. I'm very, I guess because... I'm a pastor. We just get avoided. Oh, well. But there's lots of of ideas. And actually, back in Galatia, there were some parties. A party of, you know, Christians who believed the gospel, that salvation, our being rescued and made right with God, was by trusting in the gift of his righteousness, not by doing stuff. And then there was another party called the Judaizers. And and these guys were saying, hey, yeah, yeah, Jesus. And now now uh, now that we have your attention with that whole Jesus resurrection thing, let me just tell you about all that. We just kind of need to, it'll it'll be real quick. We're just going to tell you about all that law we need you to do. And that was the argument. That was the battle of the book of Galatians. The question was being asked, how do I become right before God? Because here's the deal. You already care about this. If you care about being right at all, you care about being right all the way. Wouldn't it stand to reason that if we devote so much of our education, so much of our money, and so much of our time making sure that we're on the right side of an issue, and that's what we all do, doesn't it stand to reason to at least suggest that that's because perhaps we are made in the image of a moral being who is in fact ultimate right, ultimate justice? Doesn't it at least open us up to the possibility that there has never been a people group in the history of anthropology ever found that don't have moral categories, that perhaps that's because we bear the thumbprint of a great moral lawgiver. Just something to think about. See, the question isn't, why should I care? Because you already do care. You already care about what it means to be in the right and in the wrong. The question then becomes, how? If there really is ultimate right, if there really is ultimate justness, if there really is what the Bible would use the word to to say, holiness, and if there is one who is in fact all of these things, then doesn't it stand to reason not to ask the question, well, you know, what does it mean to be righteous? But, oh my goodness, how do I get there? How do I get there? That was certainly the question on the Galatians' mind. If there is a God who is ultimate justice and ultimate righteousness and ultimate goodness, then we better ultimately know how to be on the correct side of that line. Are you with me? And that is the question of the book of Galatians right here. And so we're in the middle of a big line of reasoning that Paul offers saying how that comes to pass. And he wants to say, listen, it's not by things you do. It's not by stuff you do. It's not by law. It's not by making sure that you just obey the moral line and don't ever fall off. And then you'll be okay. Then you'll be right with God. Does that all sound familiar to you? Let's read. Verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. This is a pretty harsh principle that shows up in Scripture, that unless you keep the whole law, you are condemned by all of it. You are condemned by all of it. Now, I want you to think about this. There are over 600 moral laws given in the Old Testament. 
Jesus kind of sums them up by saying, love the Lord perfectly with everything you are and your neighbor in the same way. How you doing? How you doing? How are you doing with that? How are you doing with that? See, we like, we, we are, you know, hey, Adam, that's a very regressive standard. You know, we're in the West. We're down the road from Harvard and MIT. You know, we, we're in Cambridge. We don't talk about moral category. We don't want to talk like that. We, you know, I'm a good person. And it's typically at this point where many people that I talk to bring in Hitler as evidence of their goodness. And do you ever talk to these people? Well, I'm no Hitler. Like, that's something I should give you a gold star for? Like, way, way to not be a mass murdering, horrible, horrible human being and kill six million people that you don't like? Like, oh, well. <laughs> like, the, the, that comes up to me in conversation all the time. We justify ourselves not by saying, I perfectly do all of the standards that God has given, or I perfectly do all of these other standards, but by pointing to others who don't which is in and of itself a little wrong, don't you think? See, all who rely on works of the law are under a curse because unless you do all the works of the law, you are condemned by all the works of the law. That's not very good news. I'm not supposed to tell you stuff like that. Perhaps you've met some people like this. You know, the people who think that they are in fact right and righteous, and just, and holy, based on their ability to do the works of the law. Maybe you've met these people. If you grew up in church like I did, you met some of them. They all kind of walk around, uh, tucked in shirts all the time, look like they have underwear on, slightly too tight, and want to call everybody brother, and kind of look down their nose at you, because you don't quite fit their standard, and you don't measure up to their ability to obey the moral law, so therefore you are, in fact, unjust. Perhaps you know them by their other name, uh, jerks. Um, uh, jerks. These are the same, and I will thoroughly throw them under the bus. Um, th- these are the kinds of people that killed Jesus. Because he wasn't moral enough. These are people who say, listen, I've read every one of these 600 some odd laws and I am being careful to do them. And I'm going to make sure that I don't say the wrong things, do the wrong things, look at the wrong things, hear the wrong things, because I need to be made right before God. And as long as I follow my own standard of holiness, then I'm good and I can look down on others who don't quite make good enough decisions. But this isn't something that's just limited to the walls of the church. There are all kinds of people like this. This is the religious morality police guy, but let me introduce you to the irreligious immorality police guy. He's typically the guy, he's balding here. He went to Woodstock. He's got a, uh, he's got a ponytail. He smells like incense for some reason. He's always protesting something. He drives um, a Prius, which if you drive a Prius, something to think about. Oh, uh, no, I love you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just playing a little bit. I'm a little serious. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. But you know, he walks around and it's not justification by my ability to do God's moral law. It's justification by recycling. You know what I mean? Like it's a new morality. It's a new set of moral laws. Like as long as I buy everything fair trade, do my own new morality, you know, uh, walk everywhere, I'm good to the earth, give to the poor and do all the things that this group of people says I should do, then I am right. And I look down on you who don't do it. You know, these people, you know, these people, maybe some of you don't know these people because maybe you're these people. Um, If you find yourself going, you know, in my group of friends, I don't know everyone. And then you look in your fairly traded hemp handbook to see if perhaps you've noted that's probably you. Um, That's probably you. I love you, but it's probably you. Um, See, the problem with both of these guys, with super religious morality police guy and irreligious morality police guy, is that they're both wrong. The problem is that they have a set of standards by which they are living. And in their eyes, perhaps they're doing a very good job. Except that one time. See, as soon as you violate your own law, your own law condemns you. You're under the curse of it. If you make for yourself a set of rules, whether you've made them over here after whatever fashion you want, you know, be you Muslim, Hindu, secular, whatever, I don't care. Or if you do it over here and with the best of intentions, you go through the Bible and you make all the list of what it means to be a good person. As soon as you transgress your own law, then you are under the curse of the thing that you were trying to live by. Bummer. To work so hard at being holy only to find yourself in the same boat as me. This is exactly the problem that was coming up in Galatians. People were saying, oh yeah, Jesus, Jesus, he gives us new rules. He helps us obey the law, so obey the law. And if if you do that, then you'll be made just, you'll be made righteous before God. But it says here that if we do that, then we're under a curse because cursed is everyone who doesn't abide by all things written in the book. Bummer. 
he goes on with his argument saying, Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by law, for the righteous shall live by faith. See, the problem with rules is they can only illustrate your inability to do them. They're like boundary markers. But they don't help you walk down the path. Does that make sense? They just show you when you're not. My daughter's pictures look wonderful until we gave her a coloring page with big lines. <laughs> it's very Jackson Pollock. <laughs> but it doesn't work when there's lines. Are you with me? No one is justified by works of the law, even if they're biblical laws or other kinds of laws. I mean, all right, we'll go on. <laughs> It is evident that no one is justified before God by law, for the righteous shall live by faith. I love this verse. There's a really cool double entendre that happens here. Two ways, two equally valid ways to translate this Greek text. If you want to throw it up here, the righteous shall live by faith. And I would like to give you both of them today. The first is the very plain reading, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, keep that in your mind. We'll call that translation one. Are you with me? Okay, good. But another way to render this verse would be by saying that those who are by faith righteous shall live. Now, they mean essentially the same thing, but they put different emphasis on different syllables. Are you with me? They emphasize two different things. And so, uh, the righteous shall live by faith. Christians, I want you to hear this. Okay, if you're a Christian, right, you know I've been saved by grace through faith. I love Jesus. He has saved me. And this is kind of a bit of a challenging review to you. Okay, I need you to hear that the righteous shall live, shall live. Now, many of you are smart, or at least you go to institutions that you fooled into thinking you are. So you at least should know that shall live is a future tense. It's a future tense. It doesn't mean that you started by faith and then you work really hard. You start by faith, and then you do enough Bible studies, go to life and doctrine, don't do the thing, and then you'll be fine. Come on. The righteous. How do, how do the righteous? What is the set of people called righteous? The righteous are those who have been saved by grace through faith. They've been justified before God, not on the basis of their own works, not on the basis of some old or new morality, but on the basis of Christ alone, and they're trusting in him. And his trading his righteousness for their unrighteousness. Those are the righteous. And they go on living by faith. They live by faith. Are you living by faith? The scriptures say without faith it is impossible to please God. Everything that doesn't proceed from faith is sin. Did you start off well and find yourself tripping? Christians, we live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. We start living and we live in the open future by faith, by trusting in God. Not by mere mental assent, mind you. That's not faith. But by trusting in God, which we'll come back to. Now, that's translation one. Translation two, the, uh, those who are by faith righteous shall live. Now, those of you who aren't yet followers of Christ, I just I want you to hear this, this emphasis. Life, life to God, being justified with God, being justified before God, being righteous is a gift by faith. Some of you, you find yourselves in here, you're so self-condemned because of the list of to-dos. Now, this is a city full of achievers. Like, I know, I know many of you guys, you're doers. You got your list, you got your five-year plan, your ten-year plan, and man, it's condemning you right now. Because you're not there. You're not where you said on, you know, on your cool, very nice you know, Excel spreadsheet that today you should be. And so you're condemned. And yet, those who are by faith righteous will live. See, if you, if you are living for something less than God, if you are defining your life by something less than the free gift of grace, then that thing will come back to kill you. That thing will come back to kill you. Those who are by faith righteous shall live. But faith in what? Faith in what? Well, we find the what is not a what at all. It's a who. Let's follow Paul's argument a little bit further in verse 12. He says that the law is, but the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. What he means to say here is that the the law, if you do the law, that's not faith. Living by your list is not living by faith, whether it's a Christian list or not. Let me say that again. Living by your list is not living by faith. No matter how holy the list looks. 
In fact, trusting in your ability to do the right things, it's not going to work. Let me just say this, and, and I really beg you to hear it. You will die by the standards you set for yourself if those standards are anything other than faith in the grace of God. You'll die by them. You will find yourself not able to do them, and you will be judged by them. And your great epitaph on your big marble tombstone, at the end of your life, be it you lived for money, you lived for pleasure, or you tried your hardest to live for God, will say, almost. Almost. You will die by the standards that you live for if your standards are less than faith in the grace of Christ alone. You'll die by them. How many more? Let me just give you an example. Perhaps you've seen on television over and over and over. I feel like I read this news story every six months of some great preacher of morality. Who then fumbles into immorality. And it makes a wonderful headline. See, my job, now let me tell you, morality matters. But it is not central My message to you and the message of God to you this morning is not be better people so God will like you. Listen to me. That is not Christianity. The message of the gospel is you aren't good people, but God loves you anyway. There aren't good guys and bad guys, it is often said. There are Jesus and bad guys. Now, I know it's a little hard to tell because we're not all wearing black shirts and speaking with an English accent. So we don't know. That were, are you with me? Why do they always have English accents in movies? I lived in England. They're lovely people there. Um, No one owned a ray gun. Anyway. um, There aren't good guys and bad guys. There's Jesus, and then there's us. And the question of how are we made right before him is not, well, if you do these things, and um, be sure to button the top button, and call people brother a lot. Yeah, do that. And, um, yeah, woo, don't, don't watch that. Then, you, then you'll be okay. Really? Really? We are going to say to ultimate perfection, to ultimate reality, to ultimate justice, to ultimate goodness, that because I avoided rated R movies, I should be fine. Really? Really? Come on. Really? Some things are self-evidently stupid. That's one of them. That's one of them. You'll die by the standards you live for if your standards are anything less than faith in the grace of Christ. And if we stopped right here, then this is a pretty cruddy Sunday for you. Because what I basically said to you is, um, no matter what you're doing right now, and no matter how hard you try, no matter where you come from, if you find yourself aware of yourself, you have a problem. Um, You you are, uh, apart from God doing something for you, you have an infinite chasm which separates you from God irrevocably, and there's not one darn thing you can do to cross it. Let's pray. Like, really? Like, that's not good news. That's bad news. Good news isn't good news unless you know the bad news. And as one of my good friends likes to say, the gospel is the only thing that will actually tell you what's wrong with you. The wrong, the, the, what's wrong with us is that we stand unjustified, unrighteous before God, both in work and in deed, both in the things that we do and the things that we fail to do. And to assert, assert any other reality is just to be naive. Really? I mean, the world is coming apart at the seams. All of our money is about to be worth less than, you know, the chair in which you're sitting. Like, really? Really? And, and you think that after 6,000 years of human doing, and this is what we've got to show for it, that we're going to just do a little, just give us five more minutes. We've almost got this. And then it's going to be fine. Really? No. Now, I'm not advocating for disengagement from the world. We should be very engaged in the world especially now that we know that God cares so much about it that he sent his own son to rescue it. So we go on to the good news. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. At the heart of the idea of righteousness, of justification, and of how we are made right with God is this idea of exchange. This idea is the nail upon which all of Christian theology hangs, such that if you lose it, the rest of it just falls apart, just turns into meaningless sentimentalism. If we try to take Christ off the cross in my place for my sins, then we're just what Mark Twain said. We're decent people standing behind decent people, singing about being decent people. And it's meaningless. But Christ became a curse for us. 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Don't you see? It, whether you're super Christian morality guy, super Jewish morality guy, super Hindu morality guy, super secular morality guy, or any of these things which tries to do enough to be good enough so that you can justify your own existence before yourself and others, you're under a curse. You'll never, ever do it. Or you'll think that you've made it. And you will fall prey to the worst sin of all, which is pride. Thinking that you have, in fact, arrived. And that God actually owes you something. But Christ redeemed us from the curse by taking that curse. He took it from us. Guys, this is the best news in the whole world if it's true. And it is. This is the best news in the whole world that Christ took our curse from us. Took the condemnation that we all feel. I mean, shoot, we feel condemned when we can't keep our hand out of the cookie jar trying to lose five pounds. Are you with me? Like, you know what I'm talking about. You feel condemned when you can't even get your assignment or your work project done on time. How much more before the ultimate just one of the universe shall we find ourselves lacking? And yet... He's so good. He loves us so much that he didn't just throw more rules at us and say, do better, try harder. That guy did it. What's wrong with you? He said, they can't do enough. They're not going to be able to do enough. So I will go in their place for their sins such that if they trust me, if they look to my cross and they trust in my ability to rescue them, I will. I will. And I will make them righteous. Righteous. Not self-righteous. Righteous. These guys are self-righteous. And they're also unrighteous. I don't want a self-righteousness. I want a God-righteousness. Or I'm not interested. Thank you. I don't want a new plan to make myself a better me. I want God to do in me what I could never do for myself. Such that I could say with the Apostle Paul later, it is God who is at work in me both to will and to work for him. He trades with us. He exchanges with us and makes us righteous. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Justified. Justified. Made right before him by what? By works? By going to church? By going to life and doctrine? By helping me out with fall festival? Trust me, there's a bone in my body that really wants to make you think that by helping us out with some stuff around here, God will like you better. You have no idea how tempting it is for me to preach that to you sometimes. But I don't. <laughs> Because it's not true. We have been justified by faith. For God made him who knew no sin to become our sin. So that in him, in him, in him. Not by doing what he did. But in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what of it? How's your list look? Hear me. I'm not talking about just passive disengagement from the world. Where you're like, alright God. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to read. You just zap me with holiness. Mm. You know. Come on. Go put that in the pile of self-evidently stupid things that I mentioned earlier. No, of course not. Of course not. Which we'll get to in later chapters, which is why you need to come, up, come on back. Though, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Why? What's the purpose of this? Oftentimes, evangelical preaching stops right here. But there's even more. This is how good God is. There's even more. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. So, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Why? Why? So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Just so you know, if you're not ethnically part of Israel, that's you. So that the blessing of Abraham might come to you. So that we might receive the promised spirit of faith. There are at least three, but a whole lot more things that this justification by grace through faith buys for us. The first is right standing with God. And that must be said first. That must be put as central, as foundational, at the bottom floor of this great big tower we're building here of all the blessings that come from the cross. Because to be right with God, there isn't anything better. There's no amount of blessing. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of great spouse and kids. There's no amount of career that matters more than at the end of the age, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords holds you before him. And he says, you, though a sinner, are righteous because of my son. There is nothing better than that. Because in that declaration, you get God. 
You get, God, you get to be with God because you've been made like him on the cross. You get to be with him. That's where some of you are today. Some of you, you need to hear that it's not by effort, not by doing. It's by grace through faith in what Jesus has done so that you may be right. Some of you in here, you're proud. You're proud. Like, I love you, but you just need to hear that. You're proud. You're arrogant. And you actually think that by doing whatever it is that you're doing, take your pick of these moralities, that you're going to be self-justified. And that there's going to be some weird cosmic scale. It's not good to get your theology from a Looney Tunes episode, okay? There's no scale. There's Christ. Some of you need to be justified. Now, but there's, there's more. Christians, check this out. It says in, in my Bible here, so that Jesus, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Do you realize what that means? Abraham was blessed and given promises that will blow your mind. I dare you to believe some of them. I dare you. Let me just give you one blessing, set of blessings that's given to God's covenant people. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Deuteronomy 28. Just give you a list. There's a whole lot more than this. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Now hear this. Can you do that? No. Who's done that? Christ. So that if you are in Christ, you qualify for this. Let's see here. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. They'll literally run you down if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb. Blessed shall be your ground and the fruit of your cattle and the increase of your herds and your young flock. Blessed shall you be in your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come and blessed shall you be when you go. I don't know about you, but I'd I'd like to believe that. Not because, I, I'm going to say it, blessed shall I be in the city, blessed shall I be, no. Not because of some positive confession, not because of just doing the right things or putting a big target, because of Christ! In Christ, all of these blessings are ours, if you would dare to believe some of them. But we Christians, we just want to walk around here and just go, well, Jesus saved me. Yeah, he saved you, and he wants to give you some stuff. Not stuff for the sake of stuff, but man, he's called us to an amazing mission to declare this good news out here. Do you realize that he might actually want to equip you to do that? It says, following this, that he gave uh, the third thing, that you might receive the Spirit of God. That means that God, the God of the universe, wants to, in a covenant way, be present with you. I'm not talking about agreement with some esoteric standard of principles up here. Like, oh yeah, great. I'm talking about the living God taking up residence in you, such that he is with you. Some of you still don't believe me. That's okay. I dare you, Christian, to so trust in the justification that Christ has purchased for you that you can now believe these promises. I dare you. I dare you. I remember before God called me overseas to go and help plant a couple of churches over there, I I prayed every day. I would pray Deuteronomy 28. I was 20. I barely knew what I was doing. But I would pray it, like, okay, Lord, you say that I get Abraham's promises. You say that I get these promises, that these count for me somehow. So, God, I'm asking you, I'm about to go and do something I've never even imagined doing. I'm about to go help plant churches in a country I've never, help me, bless me. And do you know that he did? Do you know that he went before us? Do you know that he caused something to rise up out of nothing? Do you know what I started doing before we got here? Five and a half years later, I came back to these promises. And I said, in Christ, these promises count for me. So I believed them. Ask and I'll give the nations to you. Trust me. Test me in this, says the Lord. Be generous to me. See if I won't be generous to you. I'm not talking about some health and wealth and prosperity gospel. Any of you that have been here for more than five minutes know that I hate that. What I'm talking about is, hey, you know, God really loves his son. And if you belong to his son, and he really loves you. 
I don't know about the way you treat your kids, but 